Hello humans, this is my chemistry lab, and today we'll be, we'll be discussing chemical bonding. To make this concept interesting for high school and middle school students, I'll be using a video game approach to explain chemical bonding. I'll be using Minecraft to control the overall flow, and Python coding for the drawings of electron transfers and electron sharing. So onward. So this is my chemistry lab. Today, we will be talking about chemical bonding, which is some sort of attraction between atoms, ions, or molecules that allows for the formation of chemical compounds. But before we get into that, let's explain some basic facts first. These will come in handy later. For starters, this is the periodic table, which is a table of chemical elements arranged by atomic number, and it has two parts, metal and nonmetal. This section all the way to the staircase, so including aluminum, but not including boron, are metals, and the remaining category on the other side of the staircase are nonmetals. In the metals, there's a subcategory of transition metals. So this gray section is the transition metals. Just keep that in mind as we go on. Now onwards into chemical bonding. So these three things, a TNT, a flower pot, and a camera, what do they all have in common? That's right, they're all made of atoms. Now let me explain about atoms in more detail. So atoms are made up of protons, electrons, and neutrons, and a certain number of each creates an element. For example, eight protons, eight electrons, and eight neutrons make oxygen. And I got these values in the periodic table's atomic number. Or if I want to make aluminum, I'd put 13 protons, 13 electrons, and 14 neutrons, and I would get aluminum. As you can see here, there are many shells, and this outer shell is called the valence shell. The valence shell becomes full when it has 8 electrons in it, and it becomes stable. Since atoms want to be stable, they'll either lose or gain electrons from another element to become stable and have 8 in um, a in the outer shell. This is done through chemical bonding. Now, how many? How do you know how many electrons it has in the outer shell instead of having to draw it every time? Well, instead, you can just check the periodic table. Now, see all these columns? This tells you the number of valence electrons. We skip all the transition metals because they vary on who they're being paired with. So column 1 has 1 valence electron, column 2 has 2, we're going to skip over the column 13, column 13 has 3, column 14 has 4, and on and on until column 18, which has 8, so that'll be the number of valence electrons. Column 18 is uh, the noble gases, and so they're stable because they have 8 valence electrons um, in their outer shell. Now there are two types of bonding we'll be talking about today, ionic and covalent. In ionic bonding, ionic bonds are created when metals and nonmetals bond, and there's a transfer of electrons from the metal to the nonmetal, creating an oppositely charged ions. Now let me show you an example. So I put two aluminums, which are metals, in, and three oxygen, which are nonmetals, and I get aluminum oxide. In ionic bonds, the element with the higher electronegativity, which is an atom's tendency to pull electrons towards it, is greedy for the electrons, and so it'll pull the electrons from the other elements. Um, for aluminum oxide, oxygen, which is a nonmetal, has a higher electronegativity value, so oxygen will pull the valence electrons from aluminum. Since oxygen has a higher electronegativity, it'll pull two electrons from aluminum. No, oxygen has a complete valence shell, but aluminum still has one electron remaining in its outer shell. So we'll add a second oxygen atom, and that one electron will be pulled into that second oxygen. Now the first Al is happy, but the second oxygen um, only has seven in its electrons in its valence shell, so, and it's not happy. So we had a second aluminum, and we transfer one electron from that into the second oxygen, but we still have two uh, electrons left in the second aluminum. So we add a third oxygen, transfer those two, and all, finally all the valence shells will be full, and both aluminum and oxygen will be stable. Since electrons have a, negative, and have a negative charge, after losing electrons, aluminum will become a positively charged, which is called a cation, and oxygen will become negatively charged since it gained an electron, which is called an anion. And oxygen will also turn into oxide because its charge has changed. This only happens to the element that becomes negative. And because aluminum is now positive and oxygen is now negative, these atoms will attract and create an ionic bond. So because we added two aluminums and three oxygens, the formula becomes Al2O3. So the transition metals and ionic bonds are a rather interesting concept and need some explanation. Iron can have a different number of electrons when paired with a different nonmetal. So we have iron 2 sulfide because sulfur needs two more valence electrons to be full. Or for example, iron 3 phosphide. So phosphorus needs three more valence electrons, not two more, to be full. So iron ends up with three valence electrons in its outer shell. 
Covalent bonds are formed when electrons are shared between two nonmetals instead of one atom giving electrons to the other atom, and covalent bonds form a molecule. There are two types of bonds, polar and nonpolar. When electrons are shared evenly by two atoms, it is called a nonpolar covalent bond. For nonpolar covalent bonds, the electronegativity of both atoms are the same. Let's take the example of H2, or hydrogen gas, where the two hydrogen atoms are sharing one electron each. Both have the same electronegativity value, so the electrons are more or less attracted to one or the other. When electrons are shared unevenly by two atoms, it is called a polar covalent bond. For polar covalent bonds, one atom has a higher electronegativity than the other one. So for example, NH3, which is ammonia, when nitrogen has a higher electronegativity value, it'll pull the electron more towards it, and the shared pair of electrons will spend more time on, towards nitrogen as it has a higher electronegativity. This will result in a partial, not a full, but a partial negative charge on nitrogen and a partial positive charge on hydrogen. Here is the shape for ammonia, and as you can see, it is a shape of a trigonal pyramidal. So you might be wondering, how do we name these? Well, it's pretty easy. So here's a chart of the names. For example, 1 is mono, 2 is di, 3 is tri, etc. So for the example we've been using, NH3, we can call it ammonia, or we can call it nitrogen trihyd trihydride. You might be wondering, why don't we call it mono nitrogen trihydride? Well, you don't put mono in front of the first atom if there's only one of it. You only put a mo the mono in front for the second at um, atom. And you still need to put ide at the end, so not, it's not trihydrogen, it's trihydride. Thank you. Oh, let me show you one more cool thing as well. So I mixed together five carbons and eight hydrogens to make latex. And then I mixed together six compounds of latex, helium, some rope, and dye to make this balloon in Minecraft. So for those of you who say that I'll do my chemistry homework on pigs fly, well, you might want to go do it.